Hi, this is David Orlovsky, and welcome to the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Thank you very much. And uh, whether you're watching with our good friends on TorahAnytime.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts, it is so nice to have you along for this exciting journey. I am back from America. Uh, I did a Shabbos for a wonderful organization called Kerav Tuni, which is, you may not be able to pick this up, but it is a Hasidic organization. And if you look at the edge, you'll see 12 Strimals and me. Yeah, I was the token Litvak. And uh, I was one of the few people actually speaking in English. Um, I can't speak Yiddish. I can't speak Yiddish. It's been an embarrassment to me my entire life, especially when, you know, I was younger. <laughs> you'd meet these older people, and they would right away just talking talk to you in Yiddish. They assumed you spoke Yiddish. And I said, I don't speak Yiddish. You don't speak Jewish? You're a Jew? You don't speak Jewish? How do you not speak Jewish? <laughs> it, it sounds worse in English. You don't speak Jewish. <laughs> but the truth is, that my parents spoke Yiddish. My father grew up in a Yiddish-speaking home. And my mother grew up in bilingual. But it was their secret language. When they didn't want us to know what they were saying, they were speaking Yiddish. So I, you know, what can I do? Uh, I, I didn't pick it up. And then I went to Yeshiva Chavetz Chaim, and I learned for Tzvi Kushalevsky, and they either typed into English or into, into Hebrew. And I never, I never went to a Yeshiva where we learned in, English, in Yiddish. I never picked up Yiddish. You know, you'd pick up words, words. Uh, my oldest brother was the Greisa, and my youngest brother was the Kleiner, and I was the Andere, which means the other one. <laughs> so you used to listen to me talking. The Andere, I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> the Andere, because I'm the Andere, he's the Andere, and the Andere's Andere's Andere. Anyway, so uh, there was only one phrase that I learned, and it shows you that if you're really highly motivated, you can pick up. Gibbon the Kindelach de Geld. <laughs> I would listen for that, and then I would say, the andere is du. <laughs> so that's the extent of my Yiddish. Yeah? But, um, but most of the speakers were speaking Yiddish. It was only bad when I was like on a panel, and the other, and the other Rav was speaking in Yiddish, and he would turn from the time to go and go, was 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 And I'd go like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure they were just making fun of me, but I had no way of knowing, and I just smiled. That, uh, that smile that I used to have when I was younger and I would have to go to social events. Um, uh, I, I never mastered the art of drinking uh, alcoholic beverages, not to this day. Uh, beer smells like mold. I, I don't know how anybody drinks that. The other stuff uh, comes in, in three flavors, other types of liquor, uh, disgusting, extremely disgusting and undrinkable. And uh, so I would get myself a screwdriver uh, which is orange juice and vodka, and I would lean against a wall, put on this smile, and I would just stand there with my drink. And every now and then I would take a sip, and I thought to myself, imagine ruining a perfectly good glass of orange juice. <laughs> W.C. Fields, who was an old comic from the old days, uh, he was a terrible alcoholic, and he used to carry a hip flask. And Whenever they asked him what was in it, he would say, orange juice. So one day someone poured it out and filled it with orange juice, you know, and he takes a sip and he spits it out. He goes, who switched my orange juice with orange juice? Yeah. So I just remember that expression I would have when I'd be holding my, my drink and not smile on my face. That's what I looked like on this panel. <laughs> I have that smile on my face. All I was missing was a, uh, was a screwdriver. And, um, and uh, I don't know what they were saying. But uh, I found it so inspiring. So many people coming uh, I, I have to say it was the first Shabbos I ever went to where they gave you a complimentary uh, washing cup and bowl. Yeah, you don't always get that. You know? And I've gone to some pretty fancy events, trust me. They don't always give you that washing cup. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I will say the following, though, and that is that there was just too much food. I'm, I'm an old man. I can't eat like that anymore, you know. But uh, Baruch Hashem, it was a, such a beautiful Shabbos. And then I got to speak in New City. Um, and, I, and I said, this is my first time in New City. I've been in the Old City. When I came back, I went to the Old City, down by the Kaisal, but I've never been in New City before. So it was just so inspiring. And I went to New City, and I got to speak there about Shovim, something I have never done in my life. 
And, uh, and that's it. I'm back. I'm, I'm leaving again. I'm going back uh, to America. Hopefully, I'm going to be doing a show in Baltimore. I hope to be doing one in the five towns. Uh, only I'm not taking out any ads anymore. I'm going to be using the magic of social media. So I have no idea what that means. So those of you who know how to use social media, or even if you know how to use a sh social meteor, and we'll send it around that way, because that always makes a big bang. <laughs> so you can let me know, and I'll give you the details, and we'll publicize it in those areas. We'll do one of those, uh, you know, pay-by-the-door things, you know. The last time I did this in Baltimore, I'll never forget. Um, um, so... Uh, Lumi Weil uh, sponsors, uh, sponsors the share, you know. And, uh, well, she doesn't sponsor it. She runs it. She did, handles everything. And she used to be Lumi Drebin, a student of mine in Darchibina. And, you know, her folks come to help out, etc. And I never forget, you know, I, you know, I charged $10 at the door. And at the end of the share, Mr. Drebin stood up and said, well, that was worth 10 bucks." <laughs> <laughs> I hope you think so, too, if you're in the Baltimore area and you'll come in and listen and Hopefully you'll gain from it. If you're watching this podcast, you have a basic idea of what we do here. I try to do it a little more professionally when I'm being paid, but it's more or less the same. All right. Uh, we have a sponsorship, and this is a very special sponsor for me. I'm going to read what the people wrote, and I'm going to read you the part that he said, please do not read. <laughs> this episode is sponsored in honor of Hashem. Thank you for showering the world with constant tov and abundant bracha at every moment. Without you, we would quite literally not be here. That is special. Please keep our identities anonymous. I've already burnt off my fingerprints and assumed you an alternate identity in another city in case you don't. Thank you. Signed, the Goldbergs. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's not who it's from. But this person... Uh, person or persons <laughs> made comments already on my first podcast. They were the ones who suggest that we do it in front of the um, in front of the farm, and they were the first ones who offered the sponsor a share before we even had sponsorships. So this is historic, or as we say in Kerav Tuni, historic. <laughs> so thank you so much for your friendship and support. Um, Parsha's Kisisa, what a, what a sad Parsha. It's a sad Parsha, you know. The, the story of Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim has built to a crescendo. We come out of Mitzrayim, and we have Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim, and uh, Parsha's Mishpatim separates between the first part of Matan Torah and the second part, and you go up to the to the uh, Moshe Rabbeinu going up in the Har for 40 days and 40 nights. And then the Satan comes and is Ma'arvev Ha'olam. Messes up the world. Confuses everybody. How does the Satan do this? Where, where does the Satan's power come from? We ate from the Eight Sadas Tov I think we spoke about this once. The Eight Sadas Tov it's a mistake. People think we ate from the eight sadas, the tree of knowledge. We ate from this and we had knowledge. Other Mauritians saw from one side of the world to the other. He knew everything. He was the Shleimusai. It was, it was a complete, complete being. And, uh, and therefore, he knew everything. Yeah? Three terms. Chachma bina das. Rashi explains. Chachma is acquired knowledge. Either you've acquired it from other sources, you read the encyclopedia, uh, you um, observe nature, you use your senses. It's facts. Bina is how you use those facts to understand. Raw, raw data doesn't help you. You have to be able to process it. So what does it mean? And if you, if you can't process the information correctly, then you, you don't know what you have. After you gather all the information and you understand it correctly, then you come to Das. Das is Ani Yodeya. This is the reality. I always define Das when I teach Masil Susharm as a sense of reality. When you say Ani Yodeya, so um, it's, uh, it's describing how you understand reality. I know. This is what I know. 
Now, we often say, I know, and we don't know. The best raya is if you say it twice. I know, I know. Yeah? When you say, I know, I know, you don't know at all. Yeah? When, a, when a person says, I know, for real, what's fun about magic? Having been a magician. You know, I think it was Jerry Seinfeld who said, you know, I come in and I say, hey, listen, I know how, you, how this, this trick works, and you don't. You're an idiot. Ha, 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 ha. And I'm making fun of you. That's not what's fun about magic. What's fun about magic is it plays with your sense of das. This can't be happening. This is impossible. Yeah? The birdcage, the vanishing birdcage. Uh, Blackstone publicized this. He was a famous magician, Harry Blackstone. I saw his son, Harry Blackstone Jr., when I was uh, in fourth grade. Yeah, I saw him in a show. Um, my family went cross country. <laughs> it was an amazing thing. We went to a station wagon, and we went two weeks from New York to California and two weeks back, and we saw America. And so we stopped off in Reno, and I got to see a hotel room. Uh, that was all I was allowed to see. <laughs> well, there were a few kid-friendly shows, and they took us to one. One was Harry Blackstone Jr. The other one was Tiny Tim. If that name means anything to you, I, I'm sorry. I, I am, I'm sorry for that. But anyway, but uh, Blackstone, Harry Blackstone, had publicized this trick where you have a steel cage with two birds in it, and he brings up members from the audience, and they put their hands on the cage. They're holding the cage, and he goes, one, two, three, and it's gone. They actually brought him to court because he was charged with the endangerment of animals and he showed privately the judge how the trick was done and the birds were unharmed, right? Because it doesn't make a lot of sense to do that. You know, a magician, these, these things cost money. By the way, um, the reason magicians use doves, in case you're wondering, not just because they're white and they're, and they're photogenic, it's because when they pull in their wings, they're very small. And when they open it out, they look with a flourish. That's why um, when they make scarfs appear or disappear, in, in magic language, we call them silks. It's called silks. It's a silk production or a silk uh, color change, or whatever it is. Why silks? Because silk opens up and are very flowing, but you can, can, you can compress them very tightly so that when you're, it's easier to hide in your hand, and then you, when you give a little flip and it appears, it's, it's fantastical. But you're watching this birdcage, I'm holding the birdcage, and boom, it disappears. So, but I know that can't be happening. It's playing with your sense of das. But that's because you know for sure that can't be happening. Vayeda Adam es chave is is... Uh, Kesher, it's connection, complete connection. When I know something for real, it becomes part of my etzimetzias. That's why when it's something that's really jarring, um, you, uh, you find out you're adopted. Yeah? I don't mean you personally, but your brother. Yeah, you find out that you're adopted. Yeah. My whole sense of my world has now been turned upside down because... I lived my life with a certain set of assumptions. Or you find out your parents are aliens. I hate when that happens, right? So here you've, you've lived with a, a certain assumption and suddenly it turns out uh, it's not, you know? Um, you suddenly find out, uh, yeah, this story was in the news recently, you know, this person finds out that their father is a serial murderer. <laughs> that's, that's really awkward at family gatherings. <laughs> Dad, put down the butter knife, okay? But, uh, you know, because I know something to be true. Yeah. And that's why when you hear these scandals that come out, uh, or as we say here in Hebrew, uh, scandal, you know, so people say, it can't be. I know this person. It can't be. It can't be true. That's a, uh, that's a, that's a frightening, a frightening kind of a thing, you know? Because we know, we know what reality is, and it, and it changes on us. So the Eitz Hadas wouldn't, they already had Das, they had perfect clarity. This is called the Eitz Hadas Tov Vira. When you ate from this tree, you now knew Das Tov, and you now knew Das Ra. What's the difference between those two? Das Tov is reality. Das Ra is a false reality. It's an illusion. It's make-believe. 
and we can know things for sure that are patently false. What a difficult generation we're living in. Because we're being told crazy things. And, and it's the new normal. There was a time not that long ago in American history where uh, homosexuality was a crime. You go to prison for it. Yeah. After a while, they decriminalized it. There was a time when it was considered to be a mental illness. Today, if you think there's something wrong with it, then you have a mental illness. If you think there's something wrong with it, because you're homophobic, it's a phobia. Yeah. Can't be that you're making a moral decision that something is right or something is wrong based on the word of God. No, it can't be. You're suffering from a psychological problem. Astounding. So you're suddenly presented with things that we're left to believe is reality. So um, they're, they're bringing in uh, now, uh, it's getting more and more, they have it even by the, by, by the Kaisal, you can go, where you put on these special glasses and you're able to experience this illusion. You look around and you see things. Virtual reality, they call it. Do you hear the word? Virtual reality. It's not real. It's virtual reality. You can create. You can, you can see with your own eyes things that just aren't true. So 1985, I... Uh, I went out to LA with my wife and and uh, my baby, and uh, no, it had to be 1986. 1986. Um, uh, he had been born not that long ago. So uh, what happens? Actually, interesting, quite uh, interesting story. Uh, I was a, a chapter advisor of NCSY out in Los Angeles. It was uh, an amazing experience. This was. This was L.A. back in the 70s. Um, I later went on to become the regional director of Long Island, where I believe I was somewhat successful. But in L.A., I could have been a god. I could have made my own religion. <laughs> that was an experience I will never forget. I came back to visit years later, and my picture was still up in the youth lounge. It was uh, with flowers and incense. But anyway, but... Um, uh, it was really special, and I, there was, there was magic between us as a group. I, I never looked at it as me and the kids. We were a group. We were all in this together. I think that was part of the reason that I was successful, that I, was ne I never say you. You people need to. You. It was always us. We were, we were on a journey together. I think that's what made it so special. But, um, but I was... Uh, 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 one, of, one of my former uh, NCS wives was getting married out in L.A. And, uh, you know, I'm I, not like today where I'm such a jet setter. I fly all around the world, you know, and uh, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, I, I, you don't fly that often. You know? And according to the new Green Deal, we're doing away with airplanes anyway. So, you know, get it in while you can. But... Um, um, I was going to fly for the Hanasana, and I decided not to. And that week, a good friend of mine, his wife, suddenly died. All of a sudden. Aneurysm in the brain. Just all of a sudden, like that, died. There wasn't a question. I immediately bought a ticket. And you know, when you buy a ticket in the last minute, it's the most expensive way to buy a ticket. I bought a ticket, and I uh, flew out to pay a shiva call for a day, come back. And I remember thinking to myself, I've, you've got time for tragedy, but you don't have time for simcha. Um, so I said, okay. I said, okay. I called up. I said, I'm going to come out for the Shabbat Shabbat Me and my wife and my baby bought tickets. Flew out to, to L.A. There was a kosher hotel at the time. You know, we, uh, we stayed there. And while I was there, I felt that my son would very much like to see Disneyland. He was at that point, I think, about four weeks, five weeks. And you could tell that that's what he wanted to do. So even though it wasn't for me, but I figured, okay, you know, we make sacrifices for our children. So I went to Disneyland. Now, so do you appreciate this? 
The first time I went to Disneyland was on that family trip across the country when I went to L.A., 1968. It was very exciting. When you went to Tomorrowland, it looked like Tomorrowland. When you go to Tomorrowland now, it looks like 1968 land. You know? They had this amazing thing where you could look at the phone and see the person you were speaking to, if you can even imagine such a thing. Um, they had a monorail. I know most of you have never seen a monorail, you know. I happen to see them sometimes when I go to the airport. <laughs> but they put in a monorail, this was like state of the art, yeah. So a lot of the things that, uh, that they had at the time was really very exciting. But it's still, in, you know, 1985, 86, still somewhat interesting, you know. So um, they had just opened the haunted house. And uh, we went in the haunted house. And uh, you're in one of these cars, and they, they shake you back and forth, you know, and you see, you know, ghosts and things. And as you're leaving, there's a little sign that says, don't pick up any hitchhiking ghosts. I wasn't planning to, but it's always good advice anyway. And as we, our little car goes, you go past the mirror, and there's me, there's my wife, she's holding our son, and in between us is sitting a ghost. And he's waving. So what do I do? I, I turn and look. <laughs> There's no ghost there, yeah? And I look back at the mirror and there he is, he's waving, he winks at me and I go and look a second time. <laughs> because I was so caught up in the illusion. It, it's so, the, the, the people will, okay, so, so listen to this idea. Um, there was a film, a series of three films that came out years ago, it was called The Matrix. Basically, all of mankind doesn't exist. They're all hooked up to some machine, and everything that they think is an illusion. They're managing their entire lives. So here and there, they free people from it, and then they go off to try to destroy the machines. Echves, a whole story. But people use this as a marshal. It says, you're caught up in an illusion. You're caught up in the matrix. And uh, maybe 15 years ago, I started having kids saying, What's wrong with that? Why should I work so hard to have a real life when I could think I'm having a happy life? It's good enough. There's a, you know, a thing. If you could take a drug and be happy, you know, would you do it? And the answer often was no, because eventually it'll wear off. But what if you had a drug that never wore off? What if you could hook yourself up to a machine and have an imaginary life? I don't know if it still exists. But at one point, there was an online site called Second Life, where you could create a character for yourself in this make-believe world and live a make-believe life. And it's not that you're a superhero, or it's not that you're an ogre, or you're a, you're a, you know, a, a battle dwarf, or something like that. You're just a regular person. <laughs> you have a wife, you have children, you have a job, and you just created a, a virtual life for yourself because I'd rather live an illusion. That's the Das Hara. Das Hara is illusion. Torah is MS. Moshe MS. This I raz I am MS. Moshe MS. Moshe, Moshe, Moshe MS. Yeah. Moshe is MS. The Torah is MS. This is reality with a capital R. An illusion, I can believe that there are things that are real that aren't real. There was neighbors of ours who ended up moving out of our neighborhood of relatively small, simple homes to a much larger home. And they had a Hanukkah Zabayas, and everything was elegant. It was beautiful, fancy china, Beautiful food, everything was nice. And, you know, the, the man was making enough money that he was able to move up in the, in the world and, and his wife was very happy with this new lifestyle. And as we were sitting there, she told the following story. Listen to this story. So I was driving through the Rockaways one cold night and I saw this big metal garbage can and these people had made a fire in it 
And they were sitting around in old clothes, bottles of alcohol and brown paper bags, drinking, laughing, having a great time. And I thought to myself, how much happier are their lives than mine? <laughs> than ours. Than ours. And I thought to myself, that's it? <laughs> that's the best that you could get? A bunch of bums sitting around a fire drinking? And that to you is like, spitz chayim? <laughs> yeah, because real life is hard. Real life has got a lot of obligations and a lot of things to take care of and responsibilities, you know? So move into a make-believe life. That's what the Satan offered them. Illusion. That was the ego. It was illusion. Yeah, it came out walking and talking. It, it, uh, it was eating grass. It, um, they saw Moshe dead being carried up to Shemayim. They saw the entire world collapsing. It was all illusion. That's why when you, when you think, how could Klai do this? Look at Yeshua. Yeshua didn't even know anything was going on. He saw the same illusions everyone else was seeing, but it didn't bother him. Ay, we're all caught up in illusion. Yeah. We look at everybody else's kids. Why can't you be like him? Look at everybody else's husbands. Why can't you be like him? Look at everybody else's wives. Why can't you be like her? You see, okay, Benenu, yeah? How many times have you seen one of these perfect marriages, perfect couples, and then they get divorced? Because you don't see everything. You don't know everything. You know, there's an illusion. And we imagine if I only had that, if I, only, if I could only live this, if I had that job, if I... Lo sachmoid. That's how the Yisari said, when a Kosh Baruch was giving us reality with a capital R, the last one is lo sachmod. It's eshes reyecha. Yeah. Uh, you know, don't, don't, don't desire your friend's wife, his house, his animals. When we left, the Rav Moshe Matazio would always say, you're comparing the wife to the cow? There's either something very wrong with the wife or something very right with the cow. <laughs> and he says, if I want your house and I want your wife and I want your animals, it's because I want to be you. Because I'm sure that life would be better if I were you. And uh, I look at friends of mine who've had truly gifted lives. And, uh, and I think, gee, if I had that, if I didn't have all the learning disabilities and if I grew up in, you know, a more functional family, if I had gone to all the great yeshivas, you know, if I had, uh, if I had uh, you know, all the, all the gifts that they had. I don't know. All I can tell you is I wouldn't be me. I don't know who I'd be. You want to hear a beautiful idea? Henoch Leibowitz, Rashiva Chavetz Chaim, said this idea. Um, Rashi brings down, says, ah, Nobody did kibbutz uh, of like Esav. Because me, when I prepare food for my father, so I put on my, I, you know, I, I have my regular clothes, I cook it in, and then I serve it to him. And Esav would put on his Shabbos clothes, his special clothes, the Godim from Adma Rishon, when he would go and serve his father. So Henoch said, Shkayach, so you know what he did. Now you do it. And he said, because I wouldn't be doing kibbutz of I would just be copying Esav. And there's no chop to copying what somebody else does. Somebody says to me, uh, you know, because I, I would often ask the question, if you're only a Jew because you were born Jewish, you're saying if I was born Muslim, I'd be Muslim. If I was born uh, Christian, I'd be Christian, yeah? So people say, yeah, but uh, Masora, Masora, you know, uh, um, uh, Shuto, we get a tradition from our fathers. So when we say Shmona Esri, we say Elokeinu, Veloke Avoseinu. First, he's got to be your God. First, you have to make your own approach. And people live in this illusion. I wish I could be that person. If only I had this, if only I had that. Yeah? But that's not the way life works. You get what you get because that's 
where your kochos lie. That's where your abilities go for you to be able to do great things in this world. And there is nothing more worthless than you can do than to imagine if I was somebody else, if it was something else, if it was a different situation, if I had this. It doesn't matter, you don't. Yeah. Lord, who made the lion and the lamb, you decreed I should be what I am. Would it spoil some vast eternal plan if I were a wealthy man? Yeah. Matter of fact, it would. <laughs> you think it's easy being a billionaire? I don't know. I dive into Kirsch Baruch, he should test me just so I could find out. <laughs> but obviously, he feels that I do better being lower middle class. And uh, that's where my kochas lie. <laughs> and if I had too much money, one of the characters that I've played in my, uh, in my dramatic career um, was uh, Alfred Doolittle. We put on in school, not My Fair Lady, which was a musical adaptation, but the original Pygmalion. And I was Alfred Doolittle. And uh, he's, uh, he's described as amoral. It's not immoral, it's amoral. And, uh, you know, these, Henry Higgins takes his daughter to try to turn her into a lady, but he thinks he took her for immoral purposes. And he comes in indignant, and very upset that you took my daughter. So he says, well, what do you want? He says, well, why shouldn't I make a few dollars on the deal? <laughs> and so he wants five pounds, which back then was a lot of money, you know. So as they're talking to him, he says, oh, that's great. You know, let's give him 20. And he says, 20 is too much already. He says, 20 will go to my head. Yeah, I don't want too much money. <laughs> Just enough money, what I can handle. Well, we, we all think, we all live in these illusions. Embrace your life because it's all you got. Don't spend your time in fantasy. Don't spend your time in the make-believe. Live the life that you have. Rabbi, wouldn't it be a good time for the Messiah to come? Yes, but until he does, we'll just have to wait for him someplace else. That's it. It would be nice if things would be different, but it's not. So you play the hand you're dealt. A backgammon player doesn't complain about the dice. This is my spin. I got to figure out how to play my spin the best. Uh, when I was going through my backgammon era, you could always, I would say, what would you do with a 6-2 opener? It's fascinating what a person would do with a 6-2 opener in backgammon. It, revo- it revealed just the way you thought about the game, and then, you know, you, you, you saw your whole approach to it. But um, um, how, how you choose to do it. Yeah. You play the hand you dealt. You, you, you play your spin. It's not, that's it. This is your life. Embrace it. Make the best out of it. That's all that you can do. That's it for this week. Um, if you want to find out more about this show, visit rebbeolowski.com slash podcast. If you want to find out about this particular episode or make a comment, rebbeolowski.com slash podcast slash 20. Um, if you want to find out about upcoming events, and like I mentioned, I'm going to be doing hopefully an event in, uh, in the five towns and uh, in Baltimore. So uh, watch for it on social media, I guess. I don't know what that means even, but I'm, I'm suggest. Oh, oh, wait. Instagram. <laughs> huh? Huh? I used to say Facebook, and they said, no, now it's Instagram. Instagram. Yeah, watch that. Um, uh, yeah, so go to rebelafty.com slash events. Um, if you would like to contact me, rebelafty.com slash contact. And if you would like to sponsor an episode, it's rebelafty.com slash podcast, and click on sponsor an episode. What a tremendous host that you have. And, uh, and that's it. Um, and uh, this, what can I tell you? We, we appreciate you watching and listening. I'm Rabbi Olavsky. This is the Rabbi Olavsky Show. Mm-hmm.